Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome and thank you for joining our second session of the, 2000, uh, the 2022 Virtual Real Estate and Construction Speaker Series. My name is Kat Baisley and I'm a tax partner with Cherry Becker Advisory. Our conference this year is being offered on different days in the hopes of accommodating various schedules and meet you where you are. We are offering one hour of CPE for each of these sessions free of charge. To find out more details about our conference, we'll share a link via the chat towards the end of the presentation. And let's take, some, take care of some of the administrative things before we get started. To receive CPE credit, you must answer at least three polling questions and attend for a full 50 minutes. CPE certificates will be issued via email within 10 days. If you have not received yours after 10 days, please email cbhlearning at cbh.com. A recorded version of this webinar will be available in about one week and will be sent via email and posted to our website. And just uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A window. We'll be keeping an eye on those during the presentation. Just a short note, um, a survey will be posted at the conclusion of the webinar. We value your feedback and ask that you participate in the survey. And now that the CPE items are covered, I would like to introduce Dr. Chuck McShane, a writer, economist, and director of market analytics for the Carolinas for CoStar, the leading provider of commercial real estate information, analytics, and online marketplaces. As Director of Market Analytics, Dr. McShane analyzes economic and real estate trends in major and secondary markets in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Prior to joining CoStar in March of 2021, Chuck led the economic research team at the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance and Charlotte Chamber, where he developed industry studies and supported office and industrial relocation and expansion projects. His research has been featured in the Charlotte Business Journal, the National Observer, and the New York Times, among other media outlets, and he is based in Charlotte, North Carolina. We are thrilled that you could join us today and are honored to have you involved in our virtual real estate and construction speaker series. With that, please welcome Dr. McShane. Take it away. Uh, thanks, Kat, and thanks everyone for, uh, for having me today. Uh, happy, to, uh, happy to be here. Um, so I'll just give you an outline of what we'll cover today. There's there's a lot going on in the uh, in the real estate markets, particularly in the capital markets uh, currently. Uh, but today I'm just going to give an overview of sort of the four four uh, food groups of uh, commercial real estate. Uh, so multifamily, office, uh, industrial, and retail up, uh, update. Um, these are all um, covered by CoStar. Uh, and, and we have an in depth database on all all four of these uh, these property types. And working on a, um, um, our single family covers as well, but maintain focus primarily on, uh, on the commercial side of things today. And so we'll start with the multifamily market because that's uh, that's something I think everyone has some some familiarity with. Uh, and before we dive in, I think we're going to start with a uh, with a poll question on that. This wouldn't, shouldn't be too hard for some folks who are in the South. I think uh, we've all, we've all seen a lot of a. Uh, 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 incredible amount of growth, uh, particularly in the in the multifamily sector and, and all of these markets. Uh, but this will this will be a good uh, good brain teaser that I'll cover a little bit later uh, as we as we uh, go through here. One thing I think that's uh, what might be so surprising to some folks in the uh, in the South in particular is the um, the fact that population growth actually slowed. At, it was at one of its lowest levels uh, in in history uh, in in uh, 2021. And looking forward, we're, we're going to expect uh, a bit slower population growth overall in the U.S., particularly in that 20 to 70 age group, which is the, the um, primary driver of the workforce as well as population. So internal migration is going to be more and more important for, for regions uh, going forward. And so far, the South has really been the beneficiary of this, this shift. So while we've seen uh, some growth in, in the West, uh, particularly in places like Idaho, uh, Nevada and others. Uh, the South has really dominated in terms of total uh, total growth. We've added about 800,000 people um, last year, while the Northeast and the Midwest ha has lost population. So Texas and Florida have gotten a lot of the buzz here, but you've also seen a lot of growth uh, within 
other states like the Carolinas, like Tennessee, uh, like Georgia as well. And, and breaking that down into where uh, what metro areas have seen the, the strongest amount of growth, it's also primarily in the Sun Belt. Austin, Raleigh, um, Texas and Florida as well are, are really predominant here. You will see some surprises there like Sacramento, California, uh, Riverside, California. And these, these were primarily uh, overflow markets from places like San Francisco and Los Angeles, which just aren't building enough housing and, and are having some, some other challenges as well. And people moving further and for, further out uh, from these metro areas. Uh, one surprise, uh, I think, for some folks is that uh, the the growth of these larger metro areas was, in fact, a little bit of an outlier. So places like Nashville, places like uh, like Austin, uh, these one million or more metro areas overall actually lost population. So places like New York, San Francisco, the much larger places uh, lost population. It was really those areas that were between 500,000 to 1 million that saw the most population growth in, in 2021. Uh, these, these include markets like Greenville, South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina, uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas, um, smaller markets where people moved uh, as an as a, um, opportunities for remote work open, people moved further and further out. And you also had industrial growth, uh, industrial job growth and warehousing that tended to be located further and further out uh, from primary metro areas. So you saw growth in these secondary markets. So job growth uh, drove drove a lot of that uh, population growth in, in the South uh, and, and these smaller markets drove a lot of the demand for multifamily housing. But there's another, a third type of growth that we don't talk about quite as much that I think drove... Uh, population or drove multifamily uh, demand e even more, and that's household growth. So and one of the ways we get at this is by looking at it um, sort of indirectly by looking at the household um, home ownership rate in, in the U.S. And that had been ticking down since, uh, since about uh, 2000, uh, well, it had been ticking up since about 2016 after, the, after um, rising during the great financial crisis, global financial crisis of the late 2010s. 20, uh, early 20, 2000s and, and early 2010s, um, it had been ticking up since about 2016 due to the rise of the millennial generation as those, that group got into the, got older age into their 30s and started getting into the family formation, formation years. It also really surged in, uh, in 2020 as the pandemic uh, happened there. And that's really a, 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 a result of household consolidation more than anything else. And that was when you saw um, people moving in with, with family, renters uh, in, in dense cities, uh, moving back in with, with, uh, with parents, roommates, um, uh, holding pat uh, in, in, in their uh, situations as, as uh, uh, job opportunities sort of dried up in, early in the pandemic. And then it, uh, you saw, so that's what, what that household spike was. It wasn't people buying, all, all people buying houses. Uh, it was more household consolidation. And that's why you saw this big surge there here in, uh, as things opened up in mid 2021, uh, as a lot of people moved into the rental market. So people had stimulus money. They were able to, to afford stu studios, one bedrooms, not have to live with roommates anymore. Younger people were able to move out of their parents' house, houses, that, that sort of, uh, uh, phenomenon really drove uh, this push into the rental market and a push for smaller units, especially. You can see it's starting to normalize a little bit now as we as we um, move further past the pandemic. Uh, but that was really driving a lot of the the, the crush for multifamily and 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 um, and how housing in general uh, through the the pre post pandemic era. Now, one of the things that we've seen now is this one of the most extreme uh, changes that we've seen since interest rates have begun to rise uh, is the housing affordability index. So purchase house purchases, the ability for, for the average or median earner to purchase a home uh, has declined by a, a rapidly, um, rapidly declined by a pretty steep rate here. Now it's still not as, that's in the red line here. So you can see that prices are, are moving up, obviously as interest rates really fueled that uh, lower interest rates really fueled that pricing expansion, uh, but home, 
housing affordability, the ability of the median median household to afford the median home price uh, has declined pretty rapidly, um, which could be a could be a tailwind for the multifamily industry, uh, but it also could lead to more of that household consolidation we talked about. So just how much did this impact the uh, the apartment industry in the U.S.? Well, one of the ways we look at this is absorption, and that's uh, kind of real estate jargon. I think most folks on this call may, probably know, but um, if not, that's essentially move-ins minus move-outs. So how many people signed leases uh, versus how many people ended their leases? And we saw a record level uh, in 2021 just uh, of positive absorption. Uh, nearly 700,000 units were uh, were absorbed. Uh, so 700,000 apartment units uh, throughout the U.S., uh, more, more 700,000 more people moved in than moved out, uh, which is... Uh, we, we had never seen a year with more than 400,000 uh, of uh, positive absorption prior to that. And as we see in 2022, things are starting to normalize a bit. And um, we're, we're expecting about 300,000 um, in terms of positive uh, net absorption of, uh, of apartment units in the U.S. So things are normalizing. I think some moves were pulled forward from uh, 2020 uh, that may have happened later um, in, in 2020. To 2023, uh, so things are normalizing and slowing a bit, and you can see that in, in the vacancy rate, still quite low, but it's come up from uh, record lows of less than five percent. Uh, in this is across all property types, all multifamily property types uh, in Q3 of 2021, come up to about 5.5 percent currently, still historically low, but things are starting to loosen. We can see that too in the apartments.com search data. Uh, you, you can see here, uh, basically the green line is 2021 and you can see how much how much higher than prior years. We saw search activity, people looking for, for apartment homes, um, how much higher that was. 2021, uh, 2022, which is in the red, started out as elevated as 2021 and it has now started to, uh, to get, to, to look a little more normal. Uh, look a little more like 20, 2020. So the census data is one way we can look at this, but it's a little bit lagged um, in terms of uh, household movement. So census data only gets us up to about um, July of 2021. We'll have a new round coming out in December that'll tell us a little bit more, uh, but it's considerably lagged, especially when you're talking about uh, multifamily real estate, which runs on one year leases. And you can see here that things are also starting to normalize in terms of uh, uh, postal service data. So basically change of address data. When you look at um, just household moves, when you're moving somewhere and you fill out the change of address data, the, the, uh, the USPS um, collects that data, aggregates that data, and we can get an idea of where people are, are moving a little bit more uh, in real time. So that gets us up to about this summer, July, 2022. And you can see how things, if, if you look, take it back to 2019 and look at it from uh, throughout the pandemic, you can see how things are normalizing a little bit just by looking at, and I'm not trying to pick on Nashville here or New York, but these are two areas that were really boom towns and, and bus towns through the pandemic. Uh, and you can see that here in that big surge in, in move-ins in Nashville uh, in late 2021, early 2022, and now coming back down to normal. Uh, and in New York, still losing population, but not quite as much uh, as we saw at the height there in, uh, in mid-2021, early 2022. So surprisingly, uh, we've seen some of these other, particularly coastal markets and mid-sized markets, mid-sized metros maintain uh, some of that population growth. Uh, didn't see quite as big a surge through the pandemic, but are also uh, maintaining fairly fairly well. Places like Charleston, places like Spartanburg, uh, uh, Jacksonville, and and, and um, Charlotte as well. So with this slowdown, we expect that this record rent growth that we saw last year throughout the U.S., where it reached uh, upwards of uh, eleven percent nationwide and near twenty percent in many markets, uh, has likely peaked. We actually did see the first decline in real asking rents uh, from July uh, to, to August of this year. 
uh, and uh, we do expect that to to lead to pretty pretty rapid leveling off of of rent growth uh, going forward. Uh, we're not going to see sort of the the three to four percent rent growth we see we saw prior to the pandemic uh, over the next couple of years, largely due to the the uh, increase in supply and this cooling of demand. If you look at the areas with the highest rent growth, the markets with the highest rent growth, you can see here uh, in 2021, just, just the next two slides are just going to give you an idea of how quick, how rapidly things have shifted here. These are year over year, year rent growth numbers uh, in the, the top 20 markets and the uh, the bottom 20 markets in 2021. Uh, so the top 20 markets are on, on the uh, left-hand side and the bottom are on the right-hand side. And you can see Tampa, all the Florida markets, uh, Coastal markets, uh, Sun Belt markets were upwards of 20, 20%. All top, all top 20 markets were above 10%. So above 10% rent growth in 2021, while the lowest rent growth market was about 3%, which is typical for, for pre-pandemic eras. And these are non-inflation adjusted numbers, just to, just to let you know. Now we fast, fast forward to more recently, a couple of weeks ago, where we, we had the last round of data on this. And you can see how quickly that's that's dropped. Some of those coastal markets are still leading in terms of year-over-year -year rent growth. So Miami is at 10%, uh, Orlando at, at 8%. 8%. Um, but you've also seen some places like Jacksonville and Atlanta, which were on the top 20 list in 2021, have moved to the bottom 20 list uh, in, in 2022 in terms of year-over-year -year rent growth. And that's due to Number one, this, this slowdown in uh, um, in demand for apartments. We also had the loosening of the eviction uh, moratorium uh, in 2020, um, in late 2021, uh, and also a record amount of construction, which I'll talk about now. The U.S. apartment construction has has really surged over the last uh, several years, but particularly in when we saw the, the rapid rent growth in 2021, developers really rushed to fill that uh, fill that demand. And we've now seen uh, upwards of uh, 850,000 units currently under construction, uh, record levels in, in most markets that I cover, at least most markets I pay attention to in the, in this, in the Sun Belt uh, are, uh, are running at very high levels of, uh, of construction currently. A lot of supplies are about to come online. And this answers the poll question that we were talking about. So Nashville is actually seeing the highest level of uh, units under construction as a share of inventory. Uh, so Austin's not far behind, um, and neither is uh, Charlotte or Raleigh or Orlando. Uh, no real surprises here, um, but we are seeing this supply is coming online just as uh, absorption is starting to slow in a lot of these markets. Um, so there could be some supply headwinds uh, in, in the future here in, in many of these markets. And to look at where the supply uh, headwinds may be most at risk, we, we took a look at high-end uh, apartment growth, uh, new supply, uh, vacancy rate increases, and decline in rent growth in many markets. And we found that some of those hottest markets uh, of, of the last couple of years are also some of the markets that are at risk of uh, the greatest oversupply. So the red ones here, Austin, Phoenix, and Tampa, hit all three of these, uh, or in the top 10 of all three of these uh, metrics, and the yellow ones are in the top, uh, top 10 of at least two of these metrics. And the demand has primarily been at the high and, and mid end, um, or the, at least the growth in rent um, ha, has been in, the, in those areas. And now it's starting to normalize as all, all of that supply at the four and five star and three star level. That's CoStar's um, rating system for class A, class B, uh, class C. You can think of it that way. Uh, four and five star being class A, three star being class B, um, and then one and two star being more workforce housing. Uh, you saw the primary the largest jumps uh, in in those four and five star and three star properties that's starting to normalize now uh, as we as we look forward. So multifamily investment was also very robust. We we saw um, as we saw those rent rent growth returns um, 
grow. We, we saw a lot of uh, interest and a lot of appreciation of multifamily properties through 2021. And that that led to a real rush, uh, particularly at the end of 2022. You can see that big uh, um, that outlier there is December of 2021, when a lot of people rushed to close deals on, on multifamily. Uh, it started to slow down a little bit, but not quite as much as you would expect, um, given the, the rapid change. I think some of this has to do with a lot of these deals were rapid change in interest rates and uh, economic uncertainty. I think some of this has to do with the fact that uh, a lot of these deals were uh, not closed, but were uh, were, were locked in uh, a month or two before before they uh, came over the finish line. So we are seeing uh, that decline start to start to hit going forward. But there's still interest in in, in high end properties, particularly. I think. Uh, in some of our southern markets, we've seen the number of transactions go down, but the um, the price per door continue to to, uh, to to stay relatively strong. However, with the uh, with the decline in rents, with the the um, uh, the fact that you can get uh, more than four percent on a uh, treasury bond now, we will see uh, this investment start to slow a bit. It's, it's still been relatively strong. These are the top markets where we've seen most multifamily sales uh, in green. Uh, in the gray, bar, the gray bars, the gray lines there represent what we saw uh, in terms of total sales volume over the prior eight months. So the green bars are at the 12 month trailing average for Q3 of 2022. Um, so basically, if the green bars are under the, the gray bars, uh, you saw the, you've seen a, a de noticeable decline in total investment in Q3. Uh, if the opposite is true, you've seen a, a, a shift there. So there's a little bit of a shift happening back to the gateway markets like New York uh, and, and a noticeable slowdown in places like Atlanta uh, and Dallas. So now we'll shift over to the office market, which I think has been one of the more um, more challenged markets, more where there's much more uh, more questions about what's what's going to be the future of these markets. And we do have one poll question to start there. I don't think this one will be too hard of one. Uh, what which market has seen the highest rise in office vacancies since the first quarter of 2020? Uh, so Portland, New York, Seattle, or, or San Francisco. So we'll get to that with, with uh, we'll get to the answers on that with uh, as we as we move through. Don't think it'll be too surprising. So here's the breakdown of what what we're seeing in the office market. Uh, number one is a flight to quality, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that now. Before we dive into that, I want to walk you through this chart. It's a little bit of, of a confusing one, but it's one that we use in CoStar a lot. It's our fundamentals chart. It shows here in the in the orange bars that's net absorption. So uh, in terms of total square feet or millions of square feet here. Um, so if you're, you're seeing move, more move-ins than move-outs, if it's above, you know, if it's in positive territory and the opposite, if it's uh, in negative territory, um, <clears throat> the blue bars are net supply. So total deliveries, new space that's coming online and how that interacts. So that's the supply versus demand. And then all of that, the, the balance between that demand and supply leads to the green line here, which represents our vacancy rate. And as, as you can see here in early 2020, 2Q of 2020, second quarter, we saw the negative absorption begin to really hit. And that lasted through, uh, through mid 2021, has stabilized a bit in terms of total, um, total net absorption. We've seen positive absorption uh, over the last four quarters, but not enough to Account, account for the additional supply that came online, uh, which has led to an increase in vacancy rates, um, almost to the level of, uh, of the great financial crisis era. What's really been, been interesting is what type of properties are, uh, is this absorption happening in? And uh, primarily it's happened in four and five star properties, newer properties. Uh, so this wasn't just a, this was a, a trend that was happening before the pandemic where uh, newer properties, the newest properties, the highest end properties were seeing most of the absorption uh, really was accelerated by uh, the pandemic. 
And you can see here in terms of total absorption going back to 2017, um, companies have vacated about uh, 56 million square feet in one and two star or three star properties while they've occupied about 120 million square feet uh, in four and five star properties. It's even more telling in the age of buildings. So it's a flight to new, new buildings, it's a flight to the highest end buildings, and it's a flight to new buildings. And this color scheme is a little bit different than the others, but basically what this shows is that essentially all of the new absorption, all of the positive absorption over the last several quarters has been in newer buildings, 2010 or newer. Um, and a lot of the leasing activity we've seen in many markets has been in these newer buildings, hasn't necessarily been uh, newly generated, <clears throat> newly generated demand, but demand moving from older buildings in certain markets to, to newer ones. And you can see that by the vacancy rates, even in four and five star, are, are, are higher in four and five star units than in uh, one and two star and three star. And that's primarily because of new supply. Uh, there's a, there was a lot of a run up in new supply heading into, into the pandemic uh, that's absorbed most of the demand for, for office space, uh, even as we've seen, uh, and, and it's created a, a, a challenge to backfill some of that space in, in three and three star and one and two star buildings. The only saving grace here is that there's not that much uh, B-class office currently on the market. Um, on the other hand, we have seen you know continued le lags in leasing, and sublet volume has begun, has continued to increase. So, leasing activity obviously shut shut off uh, in mid 2020. Uh, it's come back to some extent in, in many markets. We're still about 80 percent of where it was uh, on average prior to the pandemic in, in, in 2019 or so. We've also seen record levels of sublet space go on the market. So. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, the vacancy rate's not quite as high as we saw in, in that you know, 2009, 2010 era where a, a lot of offices were, uh, uh, a lot of companies were shedding office space. But the rate of sublet space that's gone on the market, the, the, the rapidness with which companies have changed their plans for, for their office use uh, has shown up in the sublet uh, data. So we have almost 225 million square feet of uh, office space available uh, in terms of sublease space. Uh, and the majority of that is, is vacant. So about 65% of that uh, is, is vacant. So a lot of companies, and, and I think we're going to see this play out over a longer term. This, this, this um, change in, in office space needs uh, is gonna take a while to play out here because we did see a little bit of a, a downtick in early 2020 in terms of in early 2021 in terms of sublet space and it's ticked back up again uh, i think you have you know five to ten year leases some in some cases as long as 15 year leases in the office sector it's going to take a long time uh, uh for all of these leases to expire uh for for um for all of these new decisions to be made so um this is going to be a long-term long-term process We've also seen supply increases heighten challenge in some challenges in some markets. So you can see, while uh, construction did come back down a little bit in 2021, 2022, you had a lot of projects that broke ground in 2019 uh, that were delivering into the pandemic that led to led to some challenges. And I think I'll just speak from anecdotally from the perspective of Charlotte. Uh, this flight to quality have, has left a lot of questions. Uh, for certain submarkets and more, more importantly, for certain old older buildings. So you've seen, and you've seen this throughout, you've seen in Chicago with the, with the flight from downtown to, to Fulton Market, for example. Uh, in Charlotte, you've seen it uh, from uptown to, to South End. All the, the brand new buildings are there. And you have a lot of half vacant 1980s towers uh, in, in, in uptown Charlotte. Uh, so, and, and with that, You've seen vacancy rates increase uh, uh, tremendously in a lot of markets, uh, but there are a couple of different reasons. So I don't think anyone's too surprised here. This is this answers the poll question. San Francisco was the leading uh, market for increase in vacancy rate 
from uh, from 2020 Q1 to today. So 9.1 percentage points. But you also see a lot of these thriving markets uh, that we talked about, like Austin, Nashville, Charlotte, are also in the mix here in terms of increases in vacancy rate. But that's really been driven by that supply. Uh, that new supply that's come online, that you've seen these companies move to these brand new spaces, leaving the older spaces um, to be backfilled. And that's a lot slower process currently. In terms of net absorption, you've actually seen some of these markets, only a handful of markets fully recover. So Austin's actually seen more than 3.5% of its inventory absorbed uh, in a positive direction uh, over since 2020Q1, uh, whereas um, other markets, you know, while, it, while it still has seen its vacancy rate rise, if you have seen uh, uh, more uh, more absorption there um, in terms of uh, on a positive level, however, that supply has uh, has led to that increase in, in vacancy rate. Same thing in Charlotte, uh, similar thing in, in Miami, Orlando, and, and other places like that. And just to give you an idea, I'll, I'm happy to send these slides out later if you, you want to dive deeper on any of these, but you can see you know, where the biggest expansions have been um, on the on the right hand side in terms of a percentage of the existing inventory. Uh, on the left hand side, you can see where what markets have the total, the largest amount of uh, inventory and construction underway. I think there was a, a couple of big stories about New York that illustrate this, this trend that I was talking about earlier, the spike to quality. New York actually saw leasing activity reach pre-pandemic levels last quarter, uh, but net absorption remains negative. Uh, it's, it's because everyone's moving into these new buildings. And that's the same thing that you're seeing in places like Charlotte, places in these, in these uh, Sunbelt markets. Even though you have more of a, a robust job growth in these areas, uh, you are still seeing, uh, because of all the new supply, uh, um, this, this supply to quality is, is having an impact on many, many sub-markets. So surprisingly, that hasn't put a dent in rents uh, at the headline level. Uh, what we're seeing is more, um, more uh, concessions and, and more uh, TI packages and other uh, back-end ways for, for companies, for, for building owners to, uh, to entice new tenants. Um, we did see a decline in rent growth. And so just to walk you through this, these these uh, pink bars here are year-over-year -year rent growth in terms of the percentage-wise and the square footage um, rate per square foot is in the, the red line here. We did see some decline uh, in, in mid-20, obviously early on in the pandemic. We have seen it stabilize on, on nationally at around 1%, but I expect if you looked at effective rents, uh, which are a little harder to get at, a little more anecdotal, uh, you would see a uh, a decline in the in these these market rents. You've also seen a lot of newer, higher end space come online, uh, bumping uh, the the overall uh, rent rental rate up uh, because you have higher higher end properties uh, that are on the market. However, we think it's very sensitive to to a potential recession. Uh, so what I showed earlier was our base case forecast, right, which shows what we would expect if if, if everything um, continues as is. However, we have recently revised our scenario to um, look at a, a, a mild recession or a moderate recession uh, heading into 2023, uh, which we do expect will, will have an impact on, on market rents uh, through 2024. Uh, uh, and we'll see some some softening of, of rents given all of the new supply. Uh, this this takes into account the the um, Assumes a one percent decline in total GDP and uh, and um, a, a lo job losses of around five hundred thousand nationwide um, in in the next year. So we do that 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 is a new uh, part of our forecast that, that's coming forward. Not we won't see the uh, drop off that we saw. We don't project that we'll see the drop off that we saw um, during, during GFC, uh, but we do expect rent, rents to. Uh, um, on our on our downside forecast, we could see some some decline, some moderation in in rent growth on the office front. That said, on the headline front, again, we see the top 
uh, and bottom rent growth markets. Um, not too surprising here. Those uh, Florida markets are seeing the highest growth uh, and the Sunbelt markets are, are also maintaining pretty well. Uh, but you compare this, um, just for the example of Charlotte, again, you compare this to the pre-pandemic trends where we were seeing 7 to 8% rent growth annually. Um, and now we're seeing 3% rent growth in, in Charlotte just over the last year. Um, that there, there has been a, a considerable contraction. And this is in, in terms of rent growth. And this is despite the expansion of office using jobs. I mean, that's the big question is uh, we, we've, we've seen an ex expansion of jobs in the financial services industry and the professional services industry and the and until lately the the IT industry we have seen some pullback in, in tech jobs over the last month or so but um we've seen a, a broad increase in in these what were traditionally thought of as office using sectors however that hasn't really been reflected in uh, in the office uh, in, in office use currently um so, and there are a lot of different metrics out there, and I think we can talk about that maybe in the Q&A uh, in terms of uh, who's using the office. Uh, anecdotally, it seems to be uh, at about a, a two to three to three day in the office. Um, that seems to be where most companies have landed. So investment has slowed quite a bit here. Uh, we, we did see a, a similar um, similar pattern to some of the other um, property types, not quite as intense as a multifamily or, or industrial, but we did see an increase in 2021 Q4. Uh, these were particularly focused on high-end brand new assets that had single tenants in place. Uh, it was almost like buying a bond in a lot of ways for some of these. Uh, and now you've seen you've seen less of that as, as interest rates have started to start to rise. And, and this just shows you the, the markets with the most uh, investment. You do see uh, some of that focus on um, gateway markets. But the top 15 um, of, of 2020 Q3 were actually, um, you had some, some interest in, in areas um, like Atlanta, uh, like Dallas, um, some non-gateway markets uh, in addition to, to the gateway ones. But you've seen a considerable drop in investments compared to the last eight quarters in New York and Boston. So pricing has remained steady. I don't know how long that can that can that can hold hold out. Even though uh, um, yields on um, bonds, ten-year Treasuries have started to rise. Uh, again, I, I, you know, we're at a transitional point when it comes when it comes to this um, in terms of where office pricing goes uh, as um, as bonds rise, but currently we haven't seen uh, the the impact of, of those rates on on closing prices uh, in terms of office use currently. And our base case forecast shows some continuing increases in in vacancy rates going forward. Um, absorption to remain uh, relatively stable, but supply uh, will will be outpacing that. So I think the office market was one of the more challenged uh, markets, and the industrial market was was, was one of the the uh, markets that a, that a lot of people were more excited about through, throughout the pandemic, particularly when it came to e-commerce and distribution. So. I've got one question for you here, one poll question to, to kick us off here, and I'll get to why this is important later, but which market has the highest population within a four hour trucking distance? And, and it's not the usual suspects with with uh, with industrial, you know, it's not the, necessarily the gate, gateway markets. I've got Austin in here, but you've also got some of the, these uh, um, markets that don't really show up in terms of in terms of office. So Reading, Pennsylvania, Columbus and uh, Spartanburg, South Carolina. So um, let me know what you think, and we'll uh, we'll get to those answers uh, as we go through. So I think we talk about the the change in the industrial market. It's important to rewind back to the beginning of the pandemic to to talk about you know what happened in terms of good spendings and good spending and, and what drove um, 
the consumer throughout the last two years? Well, number one, you had a, a rise in disposable income through the three rounds of stimulus checks and a decline in personal expenditures uh, through not being able to go anywhere, right? Uh, not being able to, to, to spend on services, at least at the beginning. And, um, you know, rolling closures, uh, lack of commute, all of that uh, re re resulted in lower expenditures at the same time we had higher, uh, higher disposable income. And that led to a real, so if you can't spend your money on services, you're going to spend it on goods. If you're spending a lot of time at home, you're going to get new furniture, you're going to get a new, new refrigerator. And that led to a surge uh, after a slight decline the very beginning of the pandemic, it led to a rise in consumer uh, expenditures on goods. And that's that's held pretty steady. This, these are inflation adjusted uh, levels, uh, peaked in early 2021, uh, has started to, to decline a, a bit now, uh, but still as of August, 2022, which is the latest that I have on this uh, chart, it was uh, consumer spending was still on goods, was still about 5% above the trend line on inflation adjusted basis, uh, where we would have expected it to rise uh, due to the pre according to the pre-pandemic trend. Now it's come down a bit. I think the uh, the, the, the September report, uh, inflation started to eat at this. People are spending down their, um, their savings at an increasing rate, but good spending is still having an impact on, on uh, the industrial market in particular. I talked about the professional services uh, growth in the office sector, but we also saw a real surge in transportation and warehousing growth. So warehousing jobs um, increased to accommodate this, this e-commerce uh, surge. With that, with that, um, with that uptick in consumer spending came an uptick in imports. And so we saw imports grow uh, across most ports, uh, particularly uh, in the Southeast. There were some challenges in the West Coast, which, which led to some advantages for some of the Southeastern ports. Uh, but you saw imports rise um, in steadily throughout the uh, throughout 2021, 2022. Uh, just to give you a, an idea here of the change, the, the growth in, in these millions of tons here, you, you can see that the tonnage going through uh, increased at almost all ports, all of the, the East Coast ports, uh, particularly New York, Newark and New York, the largest one, uh, Savannah, uh, in terms of second largest in terms of imports. In Houston, Charleston, LA, you can see some of the challenges they had. Uh, and I think that this, this cuts off uh, in July. I think there, there's been some leveling off. We did see a, a, a slight decline in Savannah. Uh, LA's had some challenges as well. Uh, but overall, imports are still coming in above where they were in pre-pandemic levels. And this led to a, a real, real high demand for uh, for industrial space. And you can see here with the leasing activity how how quickly that surged uh, after 2020, uh, late 2020. It's come down a little bit after peaking in early 2022. Uh, but still well above where it was uh, throughout the, the prior pandemic, uh, the pre-pandemic period. It was on a steady rise, um, and, and we, we, we've done some analysis here. I don't have a, a slide on this, but we've done some analysis here on how much the shift, the, the pandemic shifted um, retail spending uh, to e-commerce, which led to a demand for more, e um, more industrial space. And uh, we estimate that it pushed forward the the, uh, the share of retail sales that came from e-commerce uh, by about two years. So, and e-commerce requires a lot more warehouse space than uh, than brick and mortar retail. And with that, you've seen vacancies decline across all property types. So the, the big question is, or all property types and all vintages. So uh, space was at a premium where it could be found uh, uh, warehousing space, uh, it, it, it was found, whether that was a 60-year-old uh, building or, or brand new. So the big question there now is, is now that we're starting to, to realize that we've probably peaked in terms of 
uh, consumer spending on goods that were that, that inflation is starting to eat, eat away at, at some of that. Um, big question now is, you know, how much of, of this is a structural shift to e-commerce, uh, and how much of this is was a was a temporary uh, surge in imports created by the pandemic. Um, I think if, if if you look at the the growth overall since 2017 in retail goods sales, 2007 in retail goods sales versus uh, where Logistics properties of, of twenty five thousand square feet or above, where you can see that that this has really tightened the availability availabilities out there. Um, and and while good sales have continued to increase by more than fifty percent on an inflation adjusted basis, uh, space to occupy uh, is is hitting its limit and was only able to rise by about thirty percent. So with that, there's a lot of new speculative construction underway. Uh, Pre-leasing trends have continued to rise, uh, but we do have record amounts of industrial um, space under construction, about 850 million square feet of it. Uh, currently, about 350 million square feet of that has been pre-leased. Uh, wasn't a problem uh, over 2021, 2022, where things were getting leased up very rapidly. Uh, still seeing that uh, strong leasing trends continue. Uh, however, we do think we are starting to see some some cracks in this with uh, with Home Depot uh, or Home Depot with Target and Amazon and a few other uh, larger retailers mentioning uh, that they may have uh, more inventory than they need and are starting to Amazon starting to put, give back some space as well as others. But vacancies are still at an all time low. So one of the things that's uh, that this surge in imports have, has done is really shift the uh, the, the, the center of, of gravity for uh, for industrial development, and it's really been around. It's happened around ports, but it has it has had impacts well inland, and this is where we'll get to that four hour trucking distance thing I talked about. So I'll I'll start with one example of the uh, port of Newark. So we've seen imports increase by almost double, right, since uh, since 2007 here. Whereas industrial space that's available, it's a rent, rentable, bu rentable, buildable, air, built area, uh, RBA, uh, has only increased by about 5% during that time, just because land has been scarce uh, and it's been difficult to build there. What that crea has created uh, is, is a demand for goods further inland in places like uh, the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania, Reading and Harrisburg. And one of the key drivers of that is uh, the ability to access ports as well as population centers and key key um, key interstate activity there. So you can see where Harris, this blue outline here on this map uh, gives you a four hour trucking distance from Reading, Pennsylvania. Uh, and you can see where the population density is. Uh, you can reach the port of Newark, you can reach the, the uh, metro area of, of Washington, D.C., as well as Philadelphia. And and, uh, and New York City, uh, that has driven the demand for uh, warehousing and uh, industrial properties further and further inland into this area. And you can see here by uh, the by market the U.S. population within a four-hour truck drive. So Reading, Pennsylvania, among these four, three Pennsylvania uh, markets, has about forty million people within a four-hour truck drive. And it has land, unlike Philadelphia, which has a little more, uh, pop, little more um, population in that area. But you can see why, uh, where, where industrial development is going is around the ability to access ports and the ability to access population centers within that four-hour trucking drive to drive distance has driven a lot of a lot of that demand. Well, why is that four-hour trucking distance important? Well, it's a lot easier to hire these with as with everything. Um, there's been challenges with with uh, labor and uh, a shortage of labor, and that has led to uh, it being a lot easier to hire short haul truckers who are able to um, get to the port, get to their uh, their destination in the large population center and get home on the same day. Um, so while we've seen uh, jobs added in that less than non long haul short haul trucking distance, 
uh, it's been a lot harder to hire the long distance over overnight over the road truck drivers. So that's leading to a lot of that um, industrial development in some of these inland areas. Been a little bit less extreme, but you've also seen it along the I-85 corridor in uh, in Greenville, South Carolina, for example. The ability to reach the port of Savannah in a little over four hours, the port of Charleston uh, in four hours, uh, and as well as Atlanta and Charlotte. I believe it's about uh, 17 million people in this in this shed. But you can repeat this throughout uh, several areas like the Inland Empire and, and, and in California and a few others. And with this, we've seen uh, Spartanburg, South Carolina, which is in that Greenville area, uh, starting from a low base in terms of total industrial um, inventory, uh, but it's it's seeing the most under construction uh, as a, as a share of inventory and of of any market uh, in in the country. And you're also seeing that in places like Stockton, California, uh, uh, Lehigh Valley is on here as well. And rent growth has been strong, particularly in places uh, where the where there's been challenges um, uh, expanding space, where there's been a, been, a, been a shortage of space. So you've seen uh, in places like Inland Empire, northern New Jersey, uh, you've seen rent growth rise more rapidly here. We're starting to see manufacturing become an additional dri additional driver of, of, of new supply. Uh, when we talk about industrial space uh, from a real estate perspective, typically it's uh, the tradable assets are more uh, more logistics oriented, uh, larger big box ones. But manufacturing, uh, as we're starting to see, you know, it may have been. Um, I think it's talked about a lot the, the idea of reshoring, and I think that may have some some uh, impact here. Um, but you're also seeing a, a real effort in getting e electric vehicle and semiconductor facilities uh, back in, into the United States. You're seeing that growth, particularly in the southeast. Uh, so this is just the, um, you won't go through all of these, but this is just a list of uh, EV or semiconductor factories that have been announced or opened in 2022. Um, so this could also drive demand for manufacturing space in, in places like, like Spartanburg, South Carolina, uh, like potentially, uh, um, seems like the South is getting more of these, but also seeing it in, in Ohio uh, as well, has seen uh, the Intel and uh, also in the West, where there's a little bit more land there. And with that, you've seen an increase in, in sales volume. Uh, 2021 set, set a record year for that. Uh, started to see some softening in, in markets like, like Dallas, uh, like Chicago, where maybe there's a little bit more supply uh, out there, uh, but still a, a um, strong year for, for industrial um, investment. However, there is a record amount of construction underway. Um, if consumer spending does slow, you could see some uh, some some leveling off of, of prices that of prices there. Uh, however, uh, we haven't seen the peak like we have in multifamily of uh, of space tightness in the industrial market yet. So last but not least, we'll talk about the retail market, which I think has been a, a little uh, somewhat surprising over the last uh, few few years. Um, so I'll start out with a with poll question. And um, this one, I don't think it's any surprise that it's it's a Sunbelt city here, but which, which market had the highest rate of retail rent growth in the past year, Atlanta, Austin, Nashville, or Charlotte? And we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so I think, yeah, I just told you about the shift to e-commerce, how uh, the pandemic sped up the, that shift by about two years. Um, and, and you can see it in, in where uh, consumer spending is, ha is happening. It, it was up throughout all categories, uh, but particularly in, in non-store retail. Surprisingly, though, retail vacancies have declined um, with a, a short, um, short-lived period of negative absorption through 2020 and early 2021, uh, we have seen uh, more um, absorption than new supply over the last several quarters nationwide, uh, which has brought overall vacancies down. Now, there's a lot of nuance here with different property types, uh, but retail vacancies have, have declined quite a bit. 
And what's really is happening there is we've taken a much more cautious approach to re retail construction since the great global financial crisis. So we've seen, um, we don't see as much speculative uh, retail development. Um, there's, you know, obviously there's some new power center development, some new um, strip center development following uh, rooftops in suburban areas. Uh, but in terms of new deliveries, which is represented in the green, green here, those have been lower than leasing activity uh, since overall, since uh, since the great financial crisis. Um, again, a lot of difference in, in, in property types. Malls are, are, are clearly struggling, but neighborhood retail, experiential retail, uh, it, it is not. Leasing activity in terms of retail is, is still, total leasing volume is still a little bit lower than it was uh, in 2020, 2016. Uh, however, it's held up uh, fairly well. And we've seen, uh, again, the Sun Belt markets have seen the, the largest, the most uh, positive absorption uh, over the last several years, while the Midwestern markets where you're having population loss um, and, and some of the Northeastern markets have, have struggled. But this gets into the nuance of, of the retail sector. Um, while we have seen a lot of negative absorption in malls, a lot of that in power centers, uh, the majority of absorption has come in strip centers, neighborhood centers, and freestanding retail over the last year. Malls and power centers have seen the lowest amount of, uh, of absorption. And you see that reflected in the vacancy rate. Uh, there's a little, little bit of a confusing chart here, uh, a lot going on, but the, the real primary uh, takeaway here is that that blue line, the mall's vacancies have increased uh, while pretty much every other property type uh, has um, has has decreased in terms of vacancy. So you saw a lot of uh, a lot of demand, particularly in strip centers, particularly in neighborhood centers, particularly in uh, grocery anchor centers, uh, uh, due to lower construction levels, um, lo less fewer fewer supply coming online. You have seen uh, more absorption in these strip centers, particularly or strip centers and neighborhood centers, particularly around where people uh, are uh, are living. Now, there's been some challenges in downtowns, obviously, uh, challenges in cent central business districts, challenges in malls, uh, but the retail um, outlook for goods that cannot be bought online ha has been fairly strong over the last year. And this is where we talk about net deliveries uh, in terms of retail. Uh, no surprise here that the Texas markets, markets where you've seen a lot of uh, population growth are seeing the most net deliveries. But look at the numbers here, 2.6 million square feet um, uh, of retail in Houston, uh, one of the largest, uh, fourth largest metro in the country. Uh, these numbers are relatively small. There's only four metros here that are adding more than 1 million square feet uh, over the last year. And you can see that also in the construction numbers. It's mostly been these general retail. There's a lot of push to drive throughs. I think everyone wanted to drive through, through in 2021, 2022. That's pulled back a little bit, but you still see uh, most of the construction being in freestanding uh, retail. And with that, you've actually seen retail rents um, increase. Uh, and they're actually rising faster. Obviously, they pulled back a little bit in 2020, but they're actually increasing faster uh, than in, uh, in then pre-pandemic trends, about 4% nationwide. And our top markets for it actually are, uh, I was somewhat surprised by that Charlotte was leading with the, about 11% uh, retail uh, rent growth, uh, uh, Nashville, Miami. Again, all the markets where you're seeing more and more population growth as well as uh, you know, both suburban population growth, as well as demand uh, in and around uh, urban neighborhoods, not necessarily CPDs. Similar pattern here when it comes to retail investment. Saw a lot of investment, particularly in strip centers, uh, which are the, which we define as uh, these 30,000 square foot or below multi-tenant uh, properties. Uh, also saw those in neighborhood centers. 
but anything where people can uh, can access experiential um, retail, coffee shops, sandwich shops, uh, boot camp, uh, fitness. Those are those are really where we've seen a lot of the, the demand. Have seen some from power centers as well, uh, in and around new suburban developments. With that pricing has uh, has begun to rise a, a bit. Going forward, we do see uh, continued relatively strong demand in terms of retail. Um, and our base ca base case forecast does show vacancies continuing to compress, but also beginning to rise uh, as we get further further out uh, past twenty twenty four. And those are all the slides I have today, but I think there's one more poll question we had. For, uh, yeah. All right, and while we wait for people to get that last poll question in, I just wanted to thank you so much, Dr. McShane, for your insight, your information today. We went through a lot of metrics. Uh, if you do have any questions for Dr. Chuck McShane, his contact info is on the slide in front of you. Of course, you can always reach out to us at Cherry Beckert, and we are happy to help you as well. I'm going to go ahead and end this poll question today. Um, there will be a short survey which will appear whenever you leave the session and with that thank you so much um dr mcshane we are delighted to have you on today thank you